Gerard, you started out the year um, converting several equity mutual funds into t ETFs. I want to talk about your new offerings here. Uh, now you're listing four fixed income ETFs and filing for 10 uh, more equity ETFs. But this, again, is somewhat actively managed. Again, investing in bonds uh, that you've got here, but you're, you're trying to figure out how you can get higher expected returns, right? That's right, and uh, we launched and listed four uh, uh, fixed income ETFs about three weeks ago, Bob, and uh, they've done well so far in terms of uh, meeting client demand, and we have over half a billion across the four fixed income ETFs in the first three weeks or so. I think Nate made a, a few very good points uh, around what's expected and unexpected, and in particular, if what's expected happens, well, then you get the expected outcome, but unexpected things may happen as well. And I, I, I will go back to the inflation point uh, that Nate was making there. And <clears throat> when you think about inflation and whether you can predict it or not predict it, uh, certainly the market over the long pull is pricing in, if you look at break-even yields, you know, around high twos into low three percentage points. Uh, but what you can't, you can't predict the unexpected, uh, but you can plan for it. And so if market participants are worried about inflation or worried about higher interest rates or lower interest rates, you can certainly plan for it. Uh, and with inflation, it's outpace it or it's hedge it. And they're your two choices. What we know over the long pull is stocks and bonds have outpaced uh, inflation. And we know that there are plenty of instruments out there like tips that can hedge it. Yeah. So again, right. I think there is a lot of uncertainty, but there's lots of choices for investors uh, to plan well for 2022. And the key, Gerard, it seems to me historically that stocks do well in periods of moderate inflation because corporations generally have pricing power and they can raise prices. The, what, the problems where I've seen is sudden inflation, like in the early 1970s, beyond expectations where corporations lose pricing power. And then you see real underperformance inflation adjusted, right? I mean, that's why we sort of are worried about inflation getting out of control. We don't care about 2% or 3% inflation a year because we know the market's going to do well long term, equities will. But when you get sudden inflation, you lose control of pricing power. Is that a right way to look at it? Yeah, when you get sudden inflation, certain assets may go down and certain assets uh, go up. So for example, if you have sudden unexpected inflation, uh, generally what happens is that inflation protected uh, bonds do a lot better than real bonds, or nominal bonds, excuse me. Uh, and so, again, if you're worried about that, there's plenty of instruments out there, like an inflation-protected strategy, uh, that can do very, very well when you have uh, unexpectedly high inflation. And so that may impact stocks in a particular way. Uh, but as, as mentioned, there, there's plenty of strategies that, that do well in those environments. Right. Inflation-protected securities haven't worked very well for many years, but they may well work well in 2022. You know, uh, Nate, I was talking to you earlier uh, about, uh, about dimensional funds and what they were doing earlier in the year. Uh, Gerard pointed out that you had a very amusing comment about dimensional funds earlier in the year uh, as they converted some of their funds to ETFs. Let me just read this to briefly here. Uh, DFA arriving late to ETFs is like Brad Pitt walking through the door of an Oscars after party at 1 a.m. Both are immediately the center of attention, and it doesn't matter that the party is already in full spring with people dancing on the tables. This is, uh, Nate, this is terrific and very, uh, very, in, very colorful. There's only a handful of firms that could have success in e could have had success in ETFs, no matter what they got involved. I think DFA uh, is one of them. I love that quote here. And, but, you know, it, other than the nice little Valentine there, the DFA, uh, Nate, it's not just them getting very involved. Uh, it's amazing the number of big firms, uh, American Century, I'm thinking, uh, even T. Rowe Price, uh, that are becoming real uh, powerhouses in the ETF business that weren't before. It's amazing. And, you know, on the note of DFA, here you have a firm that launched their first ETFs in November of last year, and already they're knocking on the door of becoming a top 10 ETF issuer. It, it's truly remarkable. I think clearly DFA has extremely strong brand recognition. They have a very loyal advisor following. They have academically re, uh, rigorous research underpinning their investment strategies. This isn't some fly-by-night operation. And I think perhaps most importantly, they've approached the market uh, from a low cost standpoint. When you're gonna enter the, the ETF terror dome, so to speak, you have to come willing to do battle. And, and part of being willing to do battle is coming in at a low, a low price point, and they've done that. 
you look across their ETF lineup, the average expense ratio is about 23 basis points and they have core exposure as low as 11 basis points. Uh, so I think they're a good proxy for what we're seeing across the entire ETF space. To your point, we've had firms like American Century, Harper, Janice Henderson, T. Rowe Price, Nuveen, all ramping up their uh, ETF businesses. And I think we're going to continue to see this, these traditional mutual fund companies that have strong legacy brands um, wanting to deliver exposure in the format that investors are wanting, and that's ETFs. Yeah, you, you know, uh, Gerard, this is quite an aggressive little uh, profile that you've got here with these 10 new ETFs. One thing that kind of uh, caught my eye, two of these equity ETFs you filed for caught my eye, uh, the International High Profitability ETF and the Emerging Markets High Profitability ETF. I, I'm, I'm wondering, is, is uh, high profitability another factor that shows outperformance along with value and small cap? I know, of course, you know, the, the, the Fama French two-factor model that came out in the early 90s indicated that small cap tends to outperform over big cap over time. Uh, value tends to outperform over growth over time. Uh, is there additional evidence now of a third factor, this profitability factor? I don't know if you want to call it uh, quality or whatever we have come to call it, is also another factor to consider. And then how do you layer that all in, these three factors, in, into your investment portfolio? So you, you got it there, Bob. Uh, it is indeed a, another factor. It is an explanatory variable when it comes to explaining differences in returns across stocks. Uh, so you can think about size, value, profitability, and the fourth one, in fact, is investment, uh, so asset growth. Uh, so how you can think about those types of strategies, Bob, is focusing on the f stocks with the highest profitability in the marketplace and how you think about layering it in then is you overweight those stocks that have high profitability but are also value and also a little bit smaller cap within that high profitability segment and those we believe have the highest expected returns uh, among the high profitability stocks so uh, thank you nate uh, for the kind words there uh, we have been uh, you know i would say in the lowest morning star decile when it comes to our fees for a long period of time uh, and we were very cognizant when we entered the etf market that uh, for similar services similar asset allocation we had to have similar uh, management fee across mutual funds or ETFs. Uh, so hopefully we, we got that right and we've had quite a bit of success in the first 12 months with the conversions and so on. As Nate mentioned, we're not knocking on that top 10 door uh, with 10 more to come. And they're largely driven by the demand from the financial professionals. Nate mentioned the advisors that we work with and, and the network of advisors that we're a part of. Uh, they've been really happy with what we've done in the first year since launching ETFs and want 10 more. Uh, for uh, 2022, uh, so we hope to be able to bring those to the market over the course of next year. And what, what, explain what high profitability means. Does it mean high profits is a percentage of total revenues, or does it mean you're growing your profits every, every year? And can you even, can you get high profitability with value, does, or is that a contradiction in terms? You can get high profitability with value, and in fact, in our value strategies, or in our core strategies, we overweight those stocks that have the lowest relative price and the highest profitability. Broadly speaking, how to think about it, uh, Bob, is, is that you take revenue, subtract off some measure of cost, so maybe you get to operating in, uh, profits or something similar, and then you can scale it by book value or assets. Uh, and when you do that, you get to a, a scaled version of profitability that you, then you can compare across firms. So you can look at one firm's profitability relative to another firm's profitability, even if one firm tends to be a lot bigger than another firm because you're scaling it by assets or book value. So that's how you compute profitability. But it's not just profitability that month, it's uh, that quarter. It's, uh, are you going looking at future expectations of profitability, of growing it more? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, what's the, I know you're taking revenues, and then you have a cost of goods sold in, in there, uh, and you're, you're figuring out some line of, of profitability, but is there expectations for future growth taken into this? Yeah, the reason that profitability tells you something about expected returns, Bob, is that it predicts future profitability. And that's true if you take the profitability over the past 12 months, or if you take changes in profitability, so profitability growth over the past 12 months. Both of those predict future profitability, or more precisely predict which firms will have high profitability relative to other firms in the future. And so we use it as a stand-in for expected profitability are one component of the expected cash flows to shareholders that a stock may generate on behalf of its investors. 
Okay. Now, Gerard, uh, I'm going to change the subject slightly. You have built out your own center for separately managed accounts to make uh, customization, I guess you call it, more available to more investors at, at scale. Of course, separately managed accounts are just individual accounts that you can charge fees on, wrap fees or whatever. How does that work in practice? What are you, what are you actually doing here? So <clears throat> we've been doing SMAs or tax managed SMAs for a long time, but recently with technology and all those types of innovations, we were able to lower our minimum from 20 million to a half a million dollars. Effectively in an SMA, what you can think about happening is that an individual owns the stocks directly in their own custodial account. And that means they can express their values, whatever those values may be, by excluding underweighting or overweighting certain stocks. They can also uh, manage towards their tax situation. In an ETF or a mutual fund, it's a commingle strategy. Everybody's in it together. If you're, it's your own account, you can manage specifically towards your tax circumstances. And so those are the two big reasons why some investors like a separately managed account is tax management and then being able to express their values about what companies they want to invest in more precisely. Uh, so we launched that, um, a, a version of that that we've been doing for a long time uh, back in September uh, and it's going well so far and I, I think that uh, it could potentially be the future uh, of investing to stand alongside mutual funds and ETFs as technology enables the cost of delivering uh, customized SMAs to individuals. It drives that down and has done over time. Yeah, it's, it's kind of remarkable. I, I, what do you think of this, Nate? Can, can you do um, institutional level management on a, a personal investor level? Um, I mean, I know Gerard is not trying to be a financial advisor to individuals here, but he, he's trying to make this available to financial advisors. Can, can you build a totally customized stock portfolio on a, you, you know, on an individual uh, a, a level and, and, and still have it on, on an institutional size? It's, it seems like you're trying to ask for a lot. Yeah, from my perspective, this will be another tool in the advisor's toolbox. And the, the fact is going to commission-free trading and the fact that those costs have come down, fractional shares, those sorts of advancements have made what I refer to as direct indexing or custom indexing much more viable to the, the mass retail investor. Uh, and I do think there are certain situations where it makes a lot of sense. If you have an individual who, let's say, works at a particular publicly traded company and they have a large allocation to that company's shares, they don't want to double down by holding those same uh, shares in a broad index. Or perhaps you have a higher net worth uh, investor where taxes are a big consideration. They have a lot of taxable uh, investment money. Direct indexing can make sense because you can tax loss harvest at the individual level. I think if you had an investor with very strong ESG considerations, direct indexing can make a lot of sense. So I think there are use cases where it will be very valuable to, to the end investor. Uh, but I see this, to Gerard's point, is sitting alongside the other vehicles that exist. I don't see this as overtaking, for instance, exchange-traded funds.